This is a Thinking Aloud podcast from the BBC, and for more details on our terms of use and much, much more about Thinking Aloud, go to our website at bbc.co.uk. Hello. Well, as you can probably tell from my uh, my confident tone, I have an almost innate sense of my own superiority. But then, compared to the rest of my family, I had I had such a wonderful start. Give me a cheer, precious firstborns. You see the confidence of a firstborn? Firstborns know that very important thing, that you were created because two people fell so madly in love with each other that they decided to create a human being out of that love. Give me a cheer, people like me, secondborn children. We were not made from love. We are toys for the firstborn. That's the sole reason we exist. Oh, because we thought it'd be nice for him to have company. Give me a cheer, third-born children. <laughs> Not many photos of you. Shapri Kosandi on BBC One's Live at the Apollo. Actually, it's just too surprising that uh, Shapri's rather lovely riff on siblings and sibling rivalry was lapped up by her audience. What one thinks of one's brother and one's sister is a common enough conversational topic. But social scientists have sometimes seemed too preoccupied with parental influences to contribute much to this popular discourse. So I was particularly pleased to come across an article in the journal Sociology which explicitly sets out to explore the manner in which sibling relationships affect one's sense of self. And he did so by interviewing young people between the ages of 11 and 15 who came from a broad range of class and ethnic backgrounds. So what sort of story did they have to tell about their relationship with their brothers and their sisters? How did they talk about these differences? How much did they stick together in adversity? And, of course, what was the significance, if any, of birth order? Well, the author of that article, it's an article called Sibling Stories and the Self, The Sociological Significance of Young People's Sibling Relationship, is Catherine Davis, and she lectures in sociology at the University of Sheffield, and she's with me now. I suppose... One of the ways in which people immediately start to talk about siblings, about brothers and so on, is in terms of rivalry and jealousy, isn't it? I mean, I think you mentioned yourself, Ed and David Miliband. Yes, yes, that was fascinating. Um, And the way the media really described the kind of competition between the brothers um, was really interesting in terms of kind of tapping into this trope about sibling relationships being imbued with rivalry and emotion. And they really had to see rivalry. We kept seeing close-ups, didn't we? You Mm. had to stare into these blank faces and discern (laughs) rivalry, we were being asked to. (laughs) But, I mean, comparisons between siblings do seem to be a bit unavoidable. I mean, here we were saying, you know, that if David had been around, you know, he'd have won the election or whatever. (laughs) seemed to be a bit unavoidable. Parents compare them, teachers compare them, they compare themselves. I mean, Tell me about what you found in your study, about all this comparing mm. going on. How, how did it mm. affect the, the, the children you were speaking to? Yeah, well, there was a couple of ways, really, that um, siblings were compared. Young people compared themselves to their brothers and sisters a lot. So when I talked to them about how they thought, what sort of person they thought they were, how they thought they might turn out in life, they would often talk about how they were similar or different to their brothers or sisters. Um, So it was quite common for young people to kind of apply these mutually exclusive labels to one another. So they might say something like, well, I'm the good one because my brother's the naughty one, or I'm the clever one, or something like that. When they were talking about their achievements at school, for example, Mm. they nearly always had to do so in saying, I've done better than my brother, or my sister isn't quite so clever as me, or whatever. Or the other way about, and that was um, an example where you could see the emotional effect of these comparisons was when young people felt that they weren't measuring up to their brothers or sisters. Um, So there's an example that springs to mind, a young girl called Francesca, Francesca, um, who was not settling in very well at school. She was in her second year of secondary school and she was not finding it very easy to make friends. Um, But her older sister had made friends quite easily and was very popular and outgoing at school. And this comparison kind of compounded Francesca's feelings that she wasn't getting on well. And physical comparisons as well. You have plenty of those. People are saying, they're faster than me or bigger than me or stronger than me or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. Um, And people are quite 
um, compelled to look for resemblances, I think, between siblings. And um, teachers would do that a lot as well. Get the names muddled up in class. Mm -hmm. um, and also, yeah, talk about whether they look similar or different. And young people were very aware of that and their own kind of sense of who they were and what sort of person they might become in the future was very much tied up in how they were similar or different. So when you had, a, like, a family of two or three children, I mean, they, it was almost inevitable, was it, that they were sort of given a role. There was a naughty one, there was a good one, there was a promising mm -hmm. one. I can remember, I think it was a novel by Bernice Rubens written years ago called Elect member, which is about the idea that someone in the family was always selected as the scapegoat, you know, the <laughs> one who everybody else talked about and put down. Yes. Something of that. Yeah, um, there was definitely examples of young people talking about being that you never really get a kind of good two or a clever two. There's the naughty one, the good one. And <laughs> um, there was one young girl who was 14 who has an older sister, who she said was the argumentative one, and a younger sister who she said was the good one. Um, and she described herself as the naughty one and she said well my younger sister she compromises us both because she's good and I thought that was really quite telling because that kind of describes this situation where when taken together the three siblings are kind of a complete whole yeah. because they've all got different roles yeah, yeah, it's, that like a, it's like a play and you, you're allocated yes. <laughs> a particular part to play yeah. <laughs> now what about the what about difference uh, about birth order I mean I was talking there I mean, I must say that sort of I hadn't realised until I brought up and started talking about your paper around the office how many people thought that birth order was absolutely critical and that as they were first born, as they were third born or whatever. Could you see it here? Did people talk in terms of the firstborn having some special characteristics? Or Yeah, birth order is really interesting um, because young people talked in a very normative sense about birth order. So they were very clear on things like, oh, well, the youngest will be the favourite or the oldest has to do everything first mm. um, and that sort of thing. But... And they had quite a lot of kind of moral ideas of what an older or a younger or a middle sibling mm. ought to be like. So they would say, oh, I wish I had a big brother because he'd look after me at school and things like that. But actually, when you ask the ones who did have big brothers what their relationship was like, it was nothing like that. And, uh -huh. um, and actually, birth order was rather complicated in my study. So a lot of the young people had quite complex sibling um, relationships, so they might might um, have step-siblings and half-siblings. Yes, yes, yeah. They might be the oldest when they're at their mum's house and then they might go to their dad's and have step-siblings and be the middle sibling. So actually, birth order wasn't as fixed as I maybe expected it would be when I went into the study and I wasn't able to categorise people very cleanly like that. I was very pleased to see that in this you drew upon Ken... Plumber's mm. uh, account of the importance of stories, of yeah. family stories. I mean, here, because I mean, you've talked about these various roles that are available, you know, the good one, the clever one, the right one, the right one. But also, I mean, there are stories in which these parts are embedded, aren't they? they yeah. And you say that stories are very, very important. I mean, in a way, they constitute the family. They, they make up the family. This yes. is what the family decides it is through the stories they tell each other. Yes, absolutely. I, I, I think that how this sense of um, sibling identity is constructed how that works is through the telling and retelling of family stories um, and one of the ways that this became particularly apparent was in a couple of my interviews with young people their parents well their mothers sat in on the interview uh -huh. and started kind of butting in and interrupting um, and in those cases I was able to see how the mother had a real kind of sense of a story to tell herself. And there was one particular example of um, a young man, 14-year-old, who had a half-brother that his dad had had in a previous relationship, and they were at the same school. And the, the boy was trying to tell me that they were good at different things at school, but the mother um, had a very different story to tell about how the half-brother wasn't as well-behaved and things like so that. So there's competition to get the story sorted. Yeah, really, there was a, a definite kind of power dynamic going on about whose story was going to be the one that <laughs> kind of won out. It's, well, as, as it were, when you come up to Christmas, I mean, one of the things that happens at Christmas, when people are sitting around the table, they retell all these old yes. stories, they refresh them, don't they? Yes. A very quick last thing, but we've got to finish, but 
uh, it'd be very interesting to if you continued this research and looked at some of these people to see whether or not you know the naughty ones turned out to be naughty or the good ones turned out to be good. Mm. To what degree this labelling produced a self-fulfilling prophecy? Yeah. I would love to do that. That would be absolutely fascinating, <laughs> and definitely to kind of see how sibling relationships shift and evolve through the life course. Yeah. Because of course they're going to change as people age. Absolutely, it's a very it's a very interesting paper. And it's really quite surprising that so little has been done. Yeah. But thank you, Catherine thank Davis. You. Thank you very much. Well, we did get some. Uh, we got some fascinating responses to last week's discussion on how elite students get elite jobs. Thank you all for these. I, I, I've got just time for this delicious story. This delicious story comes from uh, Kathy Hodgkinson. Laurie, our daughter. As a young solicitor in the Lincoln's Inn firm was asked by one of the partners to befriend and support a new recruit, quote, because they would have such a lot in common. Well, she was very willing to do this, but months later asked the partner why he had thought they would have a lot in common, because, in fact, she'd found they had almost nothing in common. He looked astonished at the question and said, you both went to comprehensive school. Meanwhile, over in the hairdressing salon, correspondent Richard Hopkins was relating this really fascinating history. <laughs> Laurie, my mother was... You remember we were talking last week about hairdressers and how people didn't acknowledge the importance of hairdressing as a crowd. Anyway, this is the letter goes. My, Laurie, my mother was a hairdresser and I grew up with her trade going on in my childhood living room, listening to my mother and her friends discuss all banner of issues, neighbourhood gossip, politics, wartime rem reminiscences. And my youngest stepdaughter, who has a first in criminology, and sociology has recently qualified as a hairstylist. And my wife's forebear was Gilbert Foam, a hairdresser and parliamentary candidate who wrote what was indeed the hairdresser's Bible, The Art and Craft of Hairdressing. Laurie, my grandmother was quite right. Never judge a person by the job they do. Thank you all. <laughs> what else? Oh, yeah, if you, if you are going to enter your article and your book for our Ethnography Award, you should take note the deadline for submissions is January the 15th. Details of how to enter are on the BBC website. But forget deadlines on articles and books. It's now time for George to have his essay marked. It's simply not sociologically valid. I think it's a defensible point of view, sir. Uh, in conservative circles, perhaps, but not in sociological ones. Are you uh, sociology, then, Dr Kirk? Yes, to all intents and purposes. But nothing I say could ever please you. Not could until it? you try a good deal harder than you do. I see. You mean not until I vote the way you do and march down the street with you and sign petitions and hit policemen? I don't insist on it, George, but it might help. There's no sociology and absolutely no humanity. It's all right to have a conflict model as long as we don't conflict with Dr Kirk. So it's all right to be democratic as long as we all agree. All right, sociology on. is revolutionary. No dirty old anything conservatives allowed. Do you remember that, I wonder? It's Anthony Scher, yes, as Howard Kirk, and Peter Hugo Daly as George in BBC One's 1981 adaptation of The History of Man by Malcolm Bradbury. I remember at the time not, not being terribly flattered to discover from so-called friends that Malcolm was supposed to have based his promiscuous, bullying, know-it-all, knee-jerk, tendentious Marxist on someone dangerously close to me. So close, in fact, that Malcolm himself subsequently felt the need to write an essay denying any such association. Thank God. Well, it's now over 40 years since the publication of Bradbury's novel, and one might have thought that Kirk's thoroughgoing belief in the wonderful new society that could be attained by the overthrow of capitalism and the annihilation of the bourgeoisie would have been, well, somewhat tempered by later historical events. But here, according to my next guest, is what really happened. Quote, for a while, it even looked as though there might be an apology forthcoming from those who had devoted their intellectual and political efforts to whitewashing the Soviet Union or praising the People's Republics of China and Vietnam, but the moment of doubt was short-lived. Within a decade, the left establishment was back in the driving seat, with Noam Chomsky and Howard Zinn renewing their intemperate denunciations of America, the European left regrouped against neoliberalism, as though this had been the trouble all along. Dworkin and Habermas collecting prestigious prizes for their barely readable but impeccably orthodox books, and the veteran communist Eric Hobsbawm rewarded for a lifetime of unswerving loyalty to the Soviet Union by his appointment as Companion of Honour to the Queen. Strong words indeed. Strong words from a new book called Fools, Frauds and Firebrands, Thinkers of the New Left. 
The author who now joins me is Roger Scruton, who's visiting professor in philosophy at the University of Oxford. And also with me in the studio, I have Mark Fisher, who's lecturer in visual cultures at Goldsmiths University of London. Now, Roger, you, I mean, you argue in that passage that the, the left has regrouped, so you need to take renewed aim, if you like. But let's begin with the first time you had a shot at this particular, uh, this particular evil or folly, as you might characterise it. That was your earlier book, Thinkers of the New Left, published while Margaret Thatcher was Prime Minister. How, how was that received at the time? <laughs> it, it, like a, it went down like a, a lead balloon, uh, and I went down with it, I'm afraid. Um, it was regarded as a kind of, uh, not just an offence to uh, all forms of decency and good manners in intellectual argument, but as proof of my complete lack of understanding and, and inter intelligence. And, you know, I sort of... Uh, it was remaindered, of course, because, but the, the publisher received... Uh, most appalling, threatening letters from colleagues saying that um, that, that that their respectable name had been smirched by by their association with me, etc. So it was not a it was not a happy time for me. Well, we can only hope that it's not quite so bad this time round. But, anyway, but let's, let's 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 turn to this new book anyway. There's quite a cast of characters. We go from the Marxist historian E.P. Thompson, French theorist Lacan, Deleuze, the American economist Galbraith, Hungarian uh, philosopher Slavoj Žižek, and I mean, do they really have enough in common to all belong in the same book, equally indicted, if you like, for their role in fostering, shaping a left-leaning mm. academy? I think they do. I, I realise that, you know, they are a ragbag uh, uh, and they come from slightly different perspectives intellectually, but they all focus on a few very narrow issues, uh, in particular issue of uh, uh, social equality uh, and so-called social justice, uh, the the e evil of the consumer society uh, and the uh, intellectual alienation that comes about through the rule of private property. All those are, uh, are themes throughout. Uh, and uh, it, it also has to be noted that they are all on the syllabus. They're all in the curriculum of the humanities. Uh, and some of them dominate, you know, some of Deleuze, for example. Uh, you know, his, his works are absolutely essential. Not essential reading, because they're unreadable, <laughs> but they're essential reference uh, for any student who wants to do an MA or, you know, in, in sociology, uh, um, literature, uh, and not so much philosophy. My subject has been relatively innocent, but, you know... Uh, let me bring you in here, Mark. I mean, you. Uh, what, what, how do you respond to this idea of these left-wing thinkers, the variety of left-wing thinkers, hold sway in the economy, if like at the expense of other ways of examining the world? Well, I think it's an interesting Freudian slip in your question there, because you said in the economy, <laughs> um, where I, I think that tells us the story that, in a way, it was, it, it, I think what Roger's saying, there's clearly some truth in it, but it's the most pyrrhic of victories, like the left... Um, or a certain form of left, um, does dominate certain areas of the academy, but those areas have very little influence beyond uh, the academic enclave themselves. The economy, um, etc., um, the big narratives about the kind of society we live in, these are dominated by, by the right, by neoliberalism. I mean, and you'd want to say that actually within universities themselves, to some extent, I mean, the marketisation of universities, you know, the, the ways in which they've changed over the years suggests that all those have been moving, if you like, not in a left-wing direction at all, but towards a much more market view of university education? Well, this is the irony of capital, that, you know, that, that these left-wing theories can be um, espoused, uh, while the actual conditions of the university itself are corporate subjugation, you know, that, that, that almost complete subordination of, uh, of almost all areas of university life to the imperatives of, of, of corporate capitalism now. So you have the odd thing that these books... I mean, you don't deny that some of these books are on the lists. They are there in the syllabus. I mean, no, no, so. I, 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 I agree, and I agree that they, that, that they perhaps have, in some sense have an un, undue influence. But um, I think that, in a way, um, is, speaks... <laughs> is to do with the weakness of the left to hold hegemonic power beyond specific enclaves, actually. This is, a, this is just a little university enclave and it really doesn't have any effect upon... Well, them. I, I, if that were true, uh, I mean, that's interesting, but if it were true, it would be very bad news for the universities because it's essentially saying that they're defining their agenda, their curriculum, their, their, 
perspective on the world in terms that have no relation to that world. Uh, there, there, there is an enclave of, uh, of sort of crypto-magical thinking, uh, which um, you have to become expert in if you're to get a PhD or whatever, or certainly if you're going to get a job, but actually it's increasingly detached from the surrounding culture. I'm not saying that the surrounding culture is healthy, but nevertheless, uh, some kind of engagement would be quite useful. Let's talk a little bit, though, I mean, we can, uh, about one of your major concerns in this book is with the language being used. Mm. I mean, you referred to that already. You used George Orwell's term, new speech, to describe the ways in which some academics uh, refuse to engage with their opponents. You also use the phrase nonsense machine in relation mm. to certain French theorists, particularly Jacques yes. Lacan. Yeah. Uh, tell me about the language and what, what language is doing here and what are your specific objections to the language of these writers? Well, uh, in my view, language has a natural use, which is to say how things are and to argue from the premises of how they are as to what we might do about it. You know, and that requires straightforward speaking with words that you uh, understand the meaning of. But uh, in the, many of the thinkers that I discuss, language is used in a kind of exorbitant way, not just the invention of uh, new terms, terms of, of new speak, which have no obvious sphere of reference, but, but strange pronouncements. Lacan, for instance, uh, tells me, uh, you know, there is no sexual relation. Uh, you know, and I, I'm saying, what, what on earth does that mean? Do, do, you, do you mean that people don't relate to each other sexually? By the time I've asked that question, he's moved on. You know, that, that, that's been proven. We dismiss that. Uh, I, I, you do not exist. And, I, 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 you know, I respond to that by saying, well, but I, I do exist. I mean, what, what am I doing here? But, ah, no, exist, spelt E-X-S-I-S-T. Don't you see? You don't exist. I mean, what you're um, saying is that really it's impossible to anyone to mount a proper criticism well, of this because absolutely. you can't... Can't really. I mean, it's impossible to find where the target is. It's a casting of spells, you know, on the opponent. So the opponent is deprived of any weapon in response. Do you have any sympathy for this critic? I mean, you must have found uh, yeah, some I've, of this. I've a surprisingly high degree of sympathy for it, perhaps. <laughs> um, but I mean, it's not. You can't all lay this at the door of the left. It was the right who started this off. It was. Hegel and uh, Heidegger, who, who started off this kind of pompous, um, oracular kind of style, I think. I mean, and, and in respect of Lacan, um, you know, I've read almost nothing to convince me that he wasn't a thoroughly unpleasant individual and that he, he was, in some sense, his own worst enemy. That, I mean, his, his, I, I, his advocates now, people like Zizek, I think the value of Zizek, one of the big values of his work, is that he does convert what for me previously before I'd read thinkers like Zizek, Lacan's completely impenetrable arguments into a clear set of propositions actually. Um, and we might also say that one of the, you have missed, you've missed a couple of people you've missed out almost because they run against your case. I mean, there's no mention of Bart in your book, I don't think, Roland Bart, who writes no. quite beautifully mm -hmm. um, and, and quite clearly. Yes. Not always in the book on fashion, but in mythologies mm -hmm. and elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Let's uh, I want to let's uh, talk about a little bit about one one particular theorist who you uh, indict. I mean, that's uh, the French philosopher Michel Foucault, um, a major influence on many academics. Um, and I used to even teach a course on Foucault myself. South at York University. Why do you think his influence is baleful? I think Foucault rewrote the whole of uh, the human condition in terms of a few basic concepts. Uh, first of all, uh, the concept of domination. He saw domination everywhere, mm. and for him, that was the fundamental fact about every institution, every custom. You know, th th there was somebody who was dominating someone else, and classes emerged from this uh, as a byproduct. Uh, and all, all the language of uh, of p politics and human relations for him was to be understood in these terms. His idea was that. Um, the idea of the episteme, the way in which we know things, is conditioned by the power that we exercise through doing so. So the concept of truth, concept of truth versus falsehood, of reasonable versus unreasonable, all those are put into a shadow by this other thing, the, the powerful versus the, the unempowered. And I think that uh, it's a very exciting way of looking at, this, at human reality, but it's also dehumanising, because it removes all those aspects of humanity whereby we come to an agreement with each other, come to accept things.
How would you respond to that? Um, well, the, the, Foucault, in a way, took over, took over those ideas from previous thinkers. I think the, the big influences on him being Nietzsche and Sartre, and and you know, I think you can see a lot of his work is coming out of the the the, the combination of those two. Um, and I think, to, to be fair, you do highlight some of the the, the problems, the kind of politics of, that are coming out of Foucault, which is, I think, in a, in a way, an impossible politics, which is, on the one hand, you want to struggle against domination, on the other, and on the other hand, um, continually valorising this position of the marginal. And, and I think that's led to quite serious problems for, for, for the left, actually. That, that, that is actually one reason why I was interested in him, because... The, the impossibility that underlies the politics, as you described it, is something which, you, which I keep coming back to in the book, the, the fact that none of this is actually applicable to human beings as they are. It's all a fantasy in, in the minds of, of, of the intellectual. The intellectual feels excluded from ordinary, everyday things. I would just have to say that, I mean, I always found Foucault, in terms of the history of sexuality, in terms of a reversal of the Victorian idea mm. that the Victorians were actually against all forms of sexual conversation and discussion... Mm in there in the history of sexuality and then that quite wonderful I think history of the prison and the, how we moved mm. to the prison and also and you like his later works as well oh, yes. very much I, I'm, uh, he writes beautifully and of course what he says about prisons uh, is uh, really quite appealing it, it's, it's clear he was a sadomasochist and he loved those things <laughs> now let's look, one last thing I mean one of the trends we haven't got time to go through all the various trends that you identify but one in left wing academic writing you find this persistent anti-consumerism don't you mm. T tell me about what you watch you object to here. I mean, surely this... I would have rather had you down as someone who rather relished this uh, attack uh, upon crass no, materialism. I, 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 I am not somebody who wants to defend the consumer culture against its left-wing critics, but I, I would also want to point out that there are some right-wing critics too, like T.S. Eliot and F.R. Levis and so on, who, who are saying the same thing. So uh, Matthew Arnold and uh, John Ruskin. In our tradition, it isn't, hasn't been a left-wing uh, uh, you know, sphere of influence at all uh, and, and it's something that concerns us all we are all aware of the fact that in the abundance of modern societies we're being dragged down by our appetites the question is what do we do about it is this a political problem or a social problem or a religious problem you know and i think that we have to stand back and see it in its full complexity you would want to say we've got to be very quick response but i mean you would want to say that if you looked at some other sociologists you might find as it were this ready acceptance of the idea of consumer culture is bad simply is, is not to be found no I and mean, if you look at the work of the um, cultural studies, um, partic particularly after uh, the influence of Stuart Hall, you know, the, the, the culture, consumer culture, see more as a terrain of struggle, the appropriation of different meanings, rather than a fixed monolith. You know? In which we simply sit and absorb or yeah. buy. Yeah. Okay. Well, I knew we would be pushed for time on this, but I hope um, I, we've managed to give some flavour of the book at least. So uh, let me yes, thank, well, thank you, you. Uh, Roger Scruton. Thank you very much, and Mark Fisher. Thank you very much. And that's all we have time for today. Thanks. Well, I do hope you enjoyed that programme. And if you'd like to hear something similar, why not try downloading the In Our Time podcast at bbc.co.uk slash radio4.